All right, students, so today, in fact, we are actually going to do 2012 paper, um, unit two, paper two, all right, module three, which is environmental pollution. All right, let's go through this question um, thoroughly here, please. Question 5A, figure six illustrates the results of a two-month monitoring exercise conducted to determine the level of BOD. BOD stands for biological oxygen demand, all right, BOD, which is right here. Um, found in the effluent of sewage treatment plant. Now, during the course of the monitoring period, there were, in fact, um, a number of periods where the sewage treatment plant was, in fact, malfunctioning. Okay? Study figure six below and use the data, all right, it provides to answer the questions that follow. Let us look at this graph properly for you. Um, as you can see, on the x-axis, we are seeing these, all right, we see in zero all the way up till 60. And we are, in fact, seeing on the y-axis, we have biological oxygen demand, which is, in fact, measured in a units milligrams per liter. Okay. Now, students, um, this is, in fact, a, a graph, right, a line graph in that regard, which is associated with a, a, a malfunctioning of a sewage treatment plant. Okay. Let us look carefully. Now, these spikes, right, are associated with malfunctions. And how did I actually determine that? The fact of the matter is that if the biological oxygen demand is high, the dissolved oxygen level would in fact be low. So students, I want you to remember for me that there is an inverse relationship between BOD and DO levels. BOD stands for biological oxygen demand. And DO levels stands for dissolved oxygen. I know this graph did not, in fact, highlight DO levels. But I just want you to remember, right, when the demand for oxygen is high, when the BOD is high, that means there is a great need for it. And if there is, in fact, a great need for um, oxygen, that simply means the actual supply of oxygen is, in fact, very low. Hence the reason why I said there's an inverse relationship between the BOD and the dissolved oxygen levels. Okay? All right, let's go through quickly with the definition. First part, they ask us here, um, define the term BOD or biological oxygen demand. So let's listen to the word, the term demand at the end of the word there, the phrase there, sorry. The biological oxygen demand is in fact a term which refers to the amount of oxygen, or in this regard, the amount of dissolved oxygen, all right, that is required by, that is required or needed or, well, in this case, demanded, right, by microorganisms to simply break down the organic constituents or perhaps even um, nutrients, all right, in a given volume of water, okay? Um, just remember... Um, as we mentioned earlier, with respect to BOD and dissolved levels, and also pay attention to something very, very important. All right, this is actually associated with a specific temperature. All right, differences in temperature would in fact influence the um, the rate of uh, degradation of that particular nutrient or that particular um, uh, organic constituent. Okay, now how many times part two now? How many times during the monitoring period was the sewage treatment plant malfunctioning? Now, we indicated earlier, we're looking at the spikes. Now, we have to have a baseline value. As you can see, all right, before the actual spikes in, in uh, the BOD values, we, see, we would have seen that there was, in fact, a general um, uh, stable right, um, plot of points here on the graph. And from, from what we can see here, we've seen this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, and we also have a small peak as well in the corner here, which is 4. All right, so there were in fact four um, uh, times, right, during which the period, during that monitoring period, where the sewage treatment plant was in fact malfunctioning. Now, for two marks, very quickly, we have to explain how we arrived at the answer in part from part two e, um, well, one e rather. Well, not really one e. This is actually question. I think it's question five. Yeah, from question five e part two. All right. The third part of the question asks us to explain how we arrive at a particular answer. Now, students, um, a malfunction would mean that there is, at a sewage treatment plant, would mean that the demand for oxygen will be high. All right? If the demand for oxygen is high, 
right? That means the actual supply of oxygen needed to break down the organic material is in fact very low. All right, and that would simply mean the spikes in the BOD level would be significantly representative of the fact that there is in fact insufficient uh, or low um, quantities of oxygen or dissolved oxygen needed by the organism to simply um, break down the nutrient content or the organic material. Okay. Okay, what were the first and the last days of the longest plant malfunction for two marks? Class, if you're careful in the graph, we are actually seeing here, days is actually on the y-axis. And we are simply seeing this region, which is somewhere around here, to this side. All right, this is the broadest, um, this is the longest duration, rather. So they ask us here for the first day and the last day. Use a ruler. Remember in the exam, work with a long ruler. We don't want to make him out small rulers. All right, you lose, use, sorry, a long ruler. Now, at this particular junction, which is beyond this particular point where my cursor is here right now, um, you realize it was in fact a spike. So this will actually correspond to the 39th day. All right, and the entire system resumed to normal conditions. All right, at this particular point, technically, at the 53rd day all right so we have 39 was the 39th day was in fact the first and the last was in fact the 53rd day keep that in mind for me please let's go through all right um on average was the biological oxygen demand concentration when the plant was operating normally what was the biological oxygen demand concentration all right now, students, this is the point where you have to take a ruler. So they're going back and forth. Sorry about that. Um, take a ruler. As a matter of fact, look at the graph here. Look at it properly for about a minute. Now, if you use a ruler and you take a straight from this side all the way down to this side, you remember it is arranged. It's not level. All right? So it will be an in-between value. Um, given the fact that they ask you to determine an average right, value, um, I would say approximately 8 milligrams per liter. All right? Okay, um, part B now. Figure 7 illustrates the lower section of the river course. Recently, oysters collected from the swamp area were found to contain a significant concentration of heavy metals. The river water was analyzed at sample A, and the water was found to have a very low concentration of heavy metals. Study the figure and then answer the questions that follow. Look carefully in the diagram as you can see on the screen here. This is the river. Sewer so treatment plan. This is in fact the sample point E where the testing was, was in fact done. Um, this is the depositional area of the swamp, which washes out into the sea. The water from the river flows out into the sea. Now, describe the pathway of heavy metal pollution in this section of the river and use the information to explain why the concentration of heavy metals all right, is much higher in the swamp's oysters than in the river water. Now, so the environmental pathway would essentially be along the river. The river itself would be the fluvial movement of water, which will transfer that substance, which in this regard, it will be associated with heavy metal or heavy metal pollution. All right. The river itself is the exact pathway. Potentially, the sewage treatment plant may, in fact, possess some concentration of heavy metals. And eventually, it washes along or deposits in this region, which is the swamp. All right, the swamp is a low-lying mudflat region which actually will harbor and deposit a lot of materials from, um, which is actually carried from upslope um, watercourses and stuff like that. Now, why would the concentration of heavy metals be much higher in the swamp's oysters? Now, primarily because of the fact that the swamp is a depositional area, that is one, and we must bear in fact that the ambient environment will have a high concentration because the materials accumulate there. Not only physically, but even biologically. Bioaccumulation is in fact um, in effect in this particular example where the ambient environment, which is the swamp, has a concentration of the contaminants and it will in fact be absorbed into the cells or the tissues of the organisms themselves. Hence the reason why the organisms would, or the swamps, the oysters in this regard, would in fact ha have a higher concentration than in the surrounding environment. They would, they are alive. 
they take in the consumed food which is already contaminated and polluted so in doing so their body will act as uh um well stores all right of these particular um waste materials okay so bioaccumulation is well underway in this specific example where the oysters themselves would in fact have a high concentration than the surrounding medium um we must also take into consideration the fact that the bcf or the bio concentration factor all right would be much higher um, as it relates to the concentration of the substance or then describe the pollutant the heavy metal pollutant would be much higher in the oysters than in the ambient environment all right which is technically the water okay now part two very quickly discuss discuss one um, possible environmental impact of the effluent of sewage treatment plant on the river itself let's go through for six marks high concentration of sewage um, effluents being spewed into the river will contribute to um, a high quantity of nutrients right being um, exposed to the environment where the microbial activity would in fact increase because of the nutrient increase in doing so the microbial activity would tantamount or will result in a reduction in the dissolved oxygen levels, thereby increasing the biological oxygen demand. And students, when that happens, the oxygen content is significantly low, which can also affect the plant productivity and also the biota, the animal life as well in the surrounding environment. In doing so, um, also we must bear in mind the turbidity will also be affected because of the, um, the increase in the effluents as well which will affect the plant photosynthetic processes in the environment, which would result in a decline in productivity, thereby contributing to organisms to die uh, with the progression of time. In addition to this, algae, right, may in fact be very significant. Algal growth or algal productivity may over, will outcompete um, original or native plant species there. And that would in fact be encapsulated under the, the, the environmental impact of eutrophication. Question number six, define the term pollutant. A pollutant refers to any substance, all right, which is introduced into our environment, which will have adverse effects upon human health, the environmental processes, or even upon the physical outlook or the aesthetics of the environment. All right, the second part of the question asks us here, the institutional framework within a country can be an underlying cause of air pollution. Discuss this statement, including three points in your response. First of all, let us understand what is the institutional framework. Um, this is, in fact, um, include a system of formal and informal laws or regulations based upon norms and customs, as well as acceptance st acceptable standards right, that uh, mold socioeconomic activity and society's behavior. All right, let us see um, one, two, three. What are the three statements we are actually going to highlight this quickly? Now, first and foremost, they may see it necessary to boost all right, industrialization and, in the, in the, and development, um, disregarding the environment for faster monetary rewards. Secondly, the adoption of renewable source of energy may be costly for the nation's economy at any given point in time. Hence, there is the conti uh, a continued use or of, of uh, environmentally degrading practices, all right? And also obviously highlighting the non-renewable resources consumption. Um, thirdly, legislation may be focused upon um, uh, a significant degree of production and product profitability rather, all right? Um, instead of focusing upon conservation of the environment, okay? Thirdly, um, tree. C1, describe the formation of acid rain. Appropriate chemical equations are required in your response. All right, look at this carefully. Water plus existing carbon dioxide in the air actually give rise to the development of carbonic acid. Also, we have sulfur dioxide plus oxygen in the, well, naturally in the atmosphere gives sulfur trioxide. Now, that sulfur trioxide interacts with existing water in the atmosphere, which is rainwater, which gives rise to sulfuric acid. Also, we have water. Um, interact with nitro, nitrogen dioxide gives rise to nitric acid as well as nitrous acid. So these actual chemicals substances exist naturally in the atmosphere when they mix with rainwater. All right, take a minute, and I want you to read the last question for me very quickly. All right, um, first and foremost, the entire country will actually be subdivided into sampling zones. Specific sampling zones will be associated and highlighted and demarcated. All right, then you will simply take um, water sample or rain sample from these respective areas, um, label them, these samples respectively, and take them back to the lab. 
You will use the same volume of water and then you will immerse litmus paper and observe the color changes. Put these color changes to the screen and, screen and you can actually determine which areas are in fact acidic, neutral or alkaline.